Hello, everybody. We're here with uh, Dr. Hal Whitehead. Uh, Hal is currently a professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax, uh, New Scotia, Canada. Uh, and Hal is a very known scientist in the marine mammal world, has work all over the, the place. Um, main species has been the, the sperm whales, the northern bottlenose whales, and um, some pilot whales as well. And the main focus was on behavior, social structure, uh, population biology and conservation, and also techniques to study all these things. Is the author of several books and has supervised several students and has been uh, writing papers since uh, a long, long time ago, <laughs> 77, and uh, also the creator of the SOC program. Uh, at that lab that uh, nowadays people uh, use a lot for studies of social structure, movements and population uh, based on individuals' uh, identifications. Uh, so, hello, Paul. Hello, hello, Joanna. <laughs> uh, okay, Hall. so do you want to tell us about a little bit? So you've been on the marine mammal field for more than 40 years, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, and I mean you've worked all over the the place, um, and uh, lately it seems that you've been focusing your work a lot on the cultural situation, cultural in marine uh, mammals or uh, uh, dolphins and whales in particular. Do you do you want to tell us a little bit about culture? Like, what is culture? What is culture in in uh, dolphins and whales? Um, and uh, is it just it's the same culture as we perceive it for humans, or is it different? Uh, so maybe just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, culture is based on social learning. The idea that we learn, or animals learn things from each other, or we learn things from each other, um, and um, so it's a way that um, animals, individuals come to be like one another. So because I learn something from somebody else, I'm, and I do things um, which I learn from them, I, um, I'm more like them in that sense. And so we as biologists can think of culture as a form of heritability, like genes, right? We get our genes from our parents, so we like our parents. Mm -hmm. We get our culture from maybe our parents, maybe our friends, maybe our teachers, maybe some idiot on the internet, and we behave like them, so we become more like them. So it, 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 culture is, one thing it's a system of heritability, like genes, um, but it, uh, it's obviously different from genes because, as I, as I just mentioned, uh, with genes we just get them from our parents, but from culture, potentially parents, but all kinds of other possibilities too. And so that changes how culture moves around and how culture affects other things. So, for instance, culture can affect ecology. So, uh, a particularly good example of that in the whale world is uh, the different ecotypes of killer whales where it looks like each ecotype has a culture of, uh, of feeding on a particular prey base, right? So we've got uh, uh, salmon eating uh, resident killer whales, we've got the mammal eating transient killer whales, we've got penguin eating killer whales down in the Antarctic and so on. Mm -hmm. And almost certainly that is because they learn these techniques uh, from each other. And uh, so that is uh, 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 how culture can affect each ecology and if you're a penguin in the Antarctic that has implications for you because if you're living in an area with these killer whales who figured out how to eat you uh, from their moms or from somebody else um, yeah it, it, it has implications it can also um, affect evolution so for instance again let's take the killer whales um, there's been some neat work showing that um, uh, the evolution in the in the cultural realm affects the evolution in the genetic realm. So, for instance, the mammal-eating uh, killer whales in the Antarctic have particular genes which look as though they help them uh, digest uh, uh, mammalian uh, meat, 
uh, rather than fish, right? So what seems to have happened there is culture has driven this particular group of killer whales to eating meat, that group to eating fish. And once that happens, you get selection for particular genes within these different groups. Um, culture can also um, uh, have ramifications for uh, conservation. And um, so for instance, I I the sperm whales that I study, um, they live in different clans and the clans seem to be culture. So each clan has a bunch of stuff that is passed down through the clan um, by learning. And these clans are female based, the males, a girl from go to the Antarctic and stuff. So sperm whale males aren't terribly important from this perspective. Anyway. <laughs> um, but the females are really important. And the females are learning all this stuff from their mothers and from their females in their clan. And so each clan has a distinctive set of way of doing stuff. And even though the clans can live in the same area, so in Eastern Pacific, where I've done some work, um, you've got several clans and um, they use the same general waters, but they use them differently. So they have different behaviors. And so one thing we've noticed is that uh, as the conditions change there, then the success of the clans varies. So in a, it, 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 we've done a lot of work off the Galapagos Islands, which is right on the equator, um, but it's, it's relatively cool from being right on the equator because there's upwelling deep waters mm -hmm. are, are productive and so on. And in normal years, it's productive there. It's a great place for marine life. And so around the Galapagos Islands, there's all kinds of wonderful, weird creatures and also normal creatures like, you know, find elsewhere like sperm whales and tuna and so on. And um, so in normal years, the one of the clans there, the what we call the regular clan, um, does better. Uh, has better feeding success. Uh, but when El Nino strikes, you know, and everything warms up and it's, it's, it's bad news for pretty much everything living in the ocean with these warm waters, less productivity, less phytoplankton, less zooplankton, less everything. Yeah. Um, then the situation's reversed. And the other main clan, the plus one clan, um, it still does worse than it would in normal years, but it's, not much worse. Whereas the regular clan, the ones who normally do very well there, are doing very, very much worse. So in that sense, um, the culture is interacting with the environmental change. And as we change the environment through uh, global warming, it's going to be, um, you know, have ramifications. And this cultural diversity may be really important for the whales there. In, this, in the same way that, uh, you know, cultural diversity he can help us deal with some of the challenges we face. So right. you know, we try and uh, preserve all that di diversity in the different cultures around the world, you know, partly because we value it per se, but partly because that diversity gives us resilience as things change. Uh, different cultures may have different answers to different um, problems. Yeah, no, that's that's excellent. And sure, now with all the climate change that it's happening and uh, all the um, well, the, 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 these problems of global warming, um, yeah. So it's it's really nice that you mentioned that it's gonna the culture is gonna have an important um, factor uh, for the survival of these animals. Yeah, and um, do you do you want to tell us how does the um, how how is it cultural uh, express ma manifest on animals? So you you mentioned a little bit, but can you give us some yeah, examples well, exactly how uh, is it through songs, through behaviors? What 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 is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the overall we don't really know because it's hard for us to to detect culture. Um, you need pretty good data to say this behavior is cultural and that one isn't. And especially with whales and dolphins, you know, who spend all their time, well, not all their time, but nearly all their time underwater, 
we don't have really good data. So um, the, our perspective on culture in other animals is um, biased towards how we look at them. So for instance, culture in chimpanzees is looked at from the perspective of human culture. You know, we do these things, do they do these things? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do, no, they don't. And, um, uh, and that's because that's the way chimpanzee science mainly works. Um, ch you know, pri those primatologists are very interested in the roots of, uh, of, of humanity. And by studying chimpanzees, they get at that. And they, they look at chimpanzees as a proto-human, so they're using technique, you know, they're using these models which fit us. Right. But as they do that, they may well miss forms of cult chimpanzee culture which aren't present in human culture. With the whales and dolphins, it's even worse, right? Because um, well, at least we don't have the bias, or we still have the bias, but it's less important. But um, our roots into their world are, are how much harder. We can't look at them and say, oh, you know, looks like he's angry, looks like he's da 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 da. Um, but our, our best roots generally into the behavior and world of the cetaceans is acoustic. I mean, they are acoustic creatures. Sound travels really well underwater. Um, our hydrophones work much better than our binoculars for watching cetaceans, yeah. stunning them. And um, the acoustic stream is typically easier to analyze than the visual stream, even if it, we did have a good visual stream. And we're getting to get a better one through things like drones, but it's still um, hard to get, hard to analyze, and so on. Whereas the acoustic stream is pretty good. You can put a hydrophone down there and you can record for years. Um, and, and, and you've got this wonderful data set. And, um, you know, the, the analysis poses some problems, but a, an acoustic wave is just a one dimensional wave. A visual thing is, is two dimensional and, you know, it has, yeah. So it, uh, much of our information about the Wilson Dolphins is acoustic. Um, and so we have a lot of information on um, uh, acoustic vocal cultures. And, um, and, and that's really where the emphasis has been. So it's on being on things like humpback whale songs. Right. Um, on things like the signature whistles of, of, of bottomless dolphins, on the calls of killer whales, on the coda patterns of um, sperm whales, <laughs> and um, yeah, a number of other things. So that those are the places where we have the best data. And and the, you know because the whales are acoustic animals, it may be where culture is most expressed by them, but it may not. You know, I'm, a, I'm not sure about that. It may be that equally their gestures to each other, their flipper movements are equally cultural and equally important, or more, perhaps more cultural or more important, and obviously we haven't got that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, the, yeah, the calls and songs and so on are our best route in there. Now we do, you know, in a few cases, we have information on other kinds of behavior, and um, and we're finding cultural elements to that. So a good, good examples of that are the greeting ceremonies of killer whales, where you have these different communities of killer whales, and this one has a greeting ceremony, which that one doesn't use. Um, uh, another example uh, for the sperm whales that I study is the different um, uh, cultural clans, the ones I was mentioning earlier about um, um, e ecology, um, have different ways of moving around, and we can measure that by following the animals and seeing where they go, and finding that you know one clan tends to move in straight long straight lines, the other one wiggles about. So that is, so we have some information on this, but it's relatively primitive compared with our information on their 
uh, vocal cultures. Right, right. Do you, do you think the, the, that uh, culture could be present in um, several species or do you think it's something that it's present in uh, large brain uh, mammals or uh, uh, you know more developed brains? Well, the, yeah, that's a big, uh, a bit of a puzzle. Um, a recent work is showing that so culture is based on this social learning, learning from each other, and and there have been some very neat studies recently showing insects can do this, fish can do this. They learn from each other. You know, you show a fish learns a good way to do something, and other other fish follow it. So they're learning from it. Right. And even out out, out there in the ocean, that's happening. So um, herring young herring are following older herring to find breeding places. And so that's a form of culture. And then they look, you know, they learn, okay, this is the way to my breeding spot. And then they do that in subsequent years. And then when they become older, the young, the young herring follow them. So, you know, th 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 this is happening for a lot of animals. And, and um, there was a wonderful experimental study a couple of years ago showing a, um, uh, showing uh, bumblebees could be learned from each other how to pull strings. Um, so, um, uh, so, you know, and these animals don't have big brains. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, but we think of culture in the big brain animals. When we think of culture in non-humans, we think of the whales and dolphins, we think yeah. of chickens, we think of elephants. Oh, think yeah. of that kind of and um, this hasn't been properly resolved yet, but my own feeling, and I think other people would agree with this, or they, but they might um, phrase it a bit differently, is that um, the ability to learn from others doesn't require a huge brain. Um, uh, th th that it's you know fairly basal. I mean, it, and it's not that different from learning from the environment. So. Um, it, to some extent, the other individuals are part of the environment of an animal, and so that uh, you know a, a smart animal is learning from everything around it, including the environment, including the other individuals, and so the second part of that is social learning. Um, but when culture becomes really important, when social learning becomes really important, so uh, an individual is learning a lot of stuff from other individuals and from a range of other individuals then it becomes quite complicated it becomes very complicated so if you think about you know maybe um, choosing a career for yourself mm -hmm. you know for the listener um, so that's a tricky thing to do and a really important thing to do and to do that you get information from all kinds of sources, right? You get it from your parents, you get it from your peers, you get it from your teachers, you get it from books, the internet, you get it from your own personal experience. And then you have to put all that together and make a sensible decision. Yep. And that's the hard part. And I think that's when the, heart, the big brain comes in. Um, okay. And uh, so I, uh, my own perspective is that yes, culture is pretty common throughout the animal world, but um, a, 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 you know, culture having a very large impact on the life of the animal is relatively rare. And that's when culture needs to be tied up with a large brain. And right. Mm -hmm. Because, or, um, you know, that's where it really counts. Um, mm -hmm. So making, you know, where, where you, who do you learn from? Do you learn from the guy you see on TV? Do you learn from your parents? Do you learn from your teacher? Do you learn from your peers? And there's all kinds of you know, possibilities there and you put them together and so on. Yeah, mm. so that, 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 that I, that's my solution to that dilemma. But yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's quite a difficult topic. And as you said, it's uh, very difficult to test as well, you know, to, to 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 prove that uh, that happens, and uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, um, a lot of 
scientists within the scientific community, community, uh, community not just on the marine mammal world, but uh, anthropology or uh, other, other science, might be a little bit reluctant to affirm this cultural situation, or are they more open now? Well, things have been getting more open. I think the, the, the uh, idea that culture is important to a lot of animals has pretty much sunk through. I mean, there's some resistance. There's, um, um, there's uh, certain fields resist in certain ways. So the molecular biologists don't like the idea of another heritable stream, right? They see <laughs> genes as the thing. So um, they're not terribly keen that you can explain differences between creatures culturally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, anthropologists, I mean, uh, the things are very mixed up. Some anthropologists have sort of given up on culture. Okay. Others are totally affronted that people speak of culture in any creatures except humans. Others are perfectly open to it and, you know, uh, and um, treat it pretty much the same as us zoologists. Right. Um, and then you get, you know, other fields like, soci uh, like psychology, where... Um, Psychologists are, are really interested in the transmission mechanism, the social learning part of it, right? So they're interested in how this information gets from one individual to another individual. And, um, and, and so that gives them a particular focus, which, um, you know, it makes them critical of some aspects. So that, for instance, they find imitation and teaching to be by far the most interesting and important kinds of social learning, rather than just following mum around and seeing what happens, which is another kind of social learning, but it's not as, for them, as sophisticated as imitation or teaching. So these are some of the dilemmas that we face. And I mean, it's good to have a richness of, um, you know, of, of, of disciplines looking at this and being critical of one another and so on. Yeah. Keeps <laughs> yeah, it helps. It helps <laughs> uh, keep going and developing more and more. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for that. Obviously, culture is a very interesting topic um, and it's so much work to be done in that uh, field. <laughs> so you've worked with the, you're, you're known as the sperm whale man. <laughs> uh, and um, you've You've written that amazing book about uh, sperm whales, and um, so why sperm whales, and how did it start with sperm whales? Were that your first whales, your first? Uh... No, they weren't actually. Um, so I, <laughs> um, I was brought up as a, uh, as a kid, as a sailor, right? And I loved the ocean and sailing in the ocean. And after I graduated from college, I bought a little boat and sailed along the coast, along this coast. Yeah, actually, I can show you that. Yeah, and uh, um, I saw some whales, and I met some whale scientists. And uh, they found that I was sort of useful to them because I could sail around and get information. Right. And, um, and I found that I, this is a great excuse for going sailing, which is what I love to do. And I love to go sailing, um, but, you know, further offshore. <laughs> and, uh, I started with humpbacks and so on, which tend to be quite close to shore. But then mm -hmm. I was, you know, really intrigued with deeper waters further away, um, longer passages. And so it kind of makes sense to do you know, try some whales which lived out there. And uh, I got that opportunity in 1981 to go and try and study. Uh, at, you know, at that point, there had been very, very little study of living sperm whales. The, the work on living whales had mainly been on whales close to shore, humpbacks, gray whales, and uh, right whales in particular. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea of going offshore and trying to study some of the treatments 
and it's still does. Yes. And then when I got out there and found the sperm whales, I found that they had this extraordinary social structure. They were you know, they're immensely social animals, and uh, and that really intrigued me. You know, the soap opera of their lives. <laughs> So um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and then the northern bottlenose whales followed from that because they're another deep water animal. Right. I, mm -hmm. I was both interested, yeah, another excuse to go sailing offshore, but also a uh, um, intrigued in the um, evolution. You know, the sperm whale is a really strange creature. And why is it strange? So one, one potential driver of all this strangeness is its deep diving. And the Northern Bottle as well is another deep diver. Um, and so the hypothesis was we would find things fairly similar with the Northern Bottle as well socially, to what we found with the sperm whales. That hypothesis was completely wrong, but it was, you know, it... It, it makes <laughs> sense though. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, it made sense. You know, it was a reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. You know, hypotheses that are wrong, um, when you find they're wrong, actually probably teach you more than hypotheses that are right. And so, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sperm whales, they do live in a complex system, uh, particularly the the females, as you you were saying. So, do you want to tell us how the females organize themselves and how the males? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, the basis of the uh, sperm whale society is uh, what we call the social unit, which is uh, about 10 females and they're young. Um, and um, here in the Atlantic, they're generally close relatives, right? So there would be a grandmother or not, a, you know, her daughters. That, so three or four generations, the females and the young males who leave the group, uh, the social unit when they're about, I don't know, 10 to 15, somewhere around that. Um, and uh, within this social unit, they're very dependent on one another. So they move around together. These are basically nomadic animals. So they're traveling long distances over the ocean in the, in the Pacific, you know, typically, if you take where a sperm whale group is now and where it is a year later, it's about a thousand kilometers away. In the Atlantic, they seem to move less than that, but okay. still quite a ways. And uh, so they move around together. They um, make these deep dives about 40 minutes to find food, you know, deep water squid generally, deep under the ocean. And while they're doing that, they babysit each other's calves. So if you see a baby at the surface with another animal, uh, in most cetaceans, that other animal is the mother. The mother, yeah. In a sperm whale, it isn't necessarily the mother. It could be one of the other females in the group, um, a young, another, or a younger uh, female, you know, another slightly older sister, or one of the young males in the group. So in some of the social units, the males babysit quite a lot. Um, so they babysit, they uh, suckle each other's young. So um, a, uh, a calf, even if you see it suckling from a female, it doesn't mean that's the mother either. Right. It could be somebody else. <laughs> um, and if they're attacked by killer whales, uh, they defend themselves communally. So they get together and, and, and protect the calf together and try and protect themselves together. Um, and uh, so even though they're feeding most of the time, perhaps 45, uh, I mean, 75% of the time, making these long dives, and, and they're separated over a few hundred meters, kilometer or so, uh, when they're doing this, for a, roughly a quarter of the day, they'll come together at the surface and socialize. And even between dives, they will, you know, get together with one another. So, um, and when they're social, you know, they're very social. They are vocalizing, they are touching, they are rubbing, they are kissing, they're doing all this stuff. So, um, yeah, it looks like this life in the social unit is vital for the young sperm whale. 
and for the older female. The um, social units get together with other social units to form groups. So if you, if you go out there and you come across some sperm whales, um, you may find one, more than one social unit. Uh, in the Atlantic, typically you only do find one, but sometimes two, three. But in the Pacific, you're more likely to find two or three and more rarely one. So the groups are bigger in the Pacific. And these groups are two or more social units who've got together for a while, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, and are spending time together. And uh, as they, uh, and they have, you know, there are friendships between the different social units. So you get two social units who spend a lot of time together and two others who go. And um, then um, what you find is that the social units who do spend time together are members of what we call the clan. I talked about the clans earlier, the same clan. And uh, yeah, so they're members of a clan and the clan has particular ways of behaving. And so social units within a clan um, have clan specific behavior. They will also have their own unit specific behavior, you know, things the unit does. And obviously individuals have different ways of behaving, they have personalities, they have things they've learned to do. Um, so there's variation at all these levels, um, which is pretty interesting and neat. And, <laughs> and the, the, the males stay more, um, they're more solitary? Or is there like, um, do you find association between males? Yeah, so um, uh, we, I've only done a little bit of work on sociality in males, but there's been some recent work by a, um, a, a graduate student in Japan, Hayao Kobayashi, um, and he has studied social structure in males of Japan and found that um, in um, uh, where the younger males who may be in their late teens or so, you know, not long after they've left their female groups are pretty social and have a, a number of, um, you know, they form, um, they, they get together with each other. They um, have um, associations uh, which look like, like they're important to them. And then as they get older and bigger, the number of these, their, uh, sociality seems to decrease. They right. spend less time with each other. They have fewer friends and, and so on. But even the biggest men, the huge great guys, do seem to have some sociality. They have some friends. So sociality in males is, is less pronounced and as they grow and they get huge, right? They get three times as big as the females. Um, you know, it, it decreases. Yeah. And, and of course, sperm whales, um, everybody uh, in the marine mammal world really wants to to know and to study the enormous brain that they have right <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, what can you tell us about their brain not much i'm not, <laughs> I'm not a, ne a neurobiologist i don't know much about it but i know i think even the neurobiologists don't know all that much about it either um i think to me one of the um uh, you know i think about it just in general terms um so a brain is an expensive thing and we put a lot of our energies into our brains right sure. we a lot of the food we eat is going to maintain our brains and we've got you know a heavy skull to protect it and, and, and so on so evolutionarily you know and then and and female humans uh well, some of them sometimes have a hard time giving birth because of the baby's brain you know is big and that's and makes it anatomically hard uh so we pay a big costs to have our big brains. And uh, that suggests that for us, evolutionarily, uh, that big brain, there's been huge you know, uh, pressure to have a big brain, that um, through human um, history, there've been big selective forces to have a big brain. Now, um, 
if you take the spermal brain, it's a lot bigger than ours. Similarly, an elephant brain is quite a lot bigger than ours too. Um, but it's in a much bigger body. And that makes it a hell of a lot easier, right? So yeah. proportionally, it's a lot smaller than ours. So um, it, it means that you can put this enormous brain in an enormous body with rather less, a lot less cost than you could put a big brain in, uh, you know. In, in, in a small um, body. Yeah, so, but now, uh, if you take the analogy with computers, which is another, you know, cognitive device. Uh, if you look, if you go to the store and look at prices on computers, you can get a big desktop, which does a, you know, has a great big processor in it, relatively cheaply, and it, it can do wonderful processing. You put the same processing power in your iPhone, and you're spending a vast amount more on that, right? Right. And I, th I see this the same way. So these big brains that we have, that sperm whales have, that elephants have, are good. You know, they can do a lot of cognition. They can figure stuff out and so on. Um, and, and all of them can. They're all big. And being big is great, you know, because it, it allows more neural connections and all that stuff. Um, but evolutionarily, I think it was probably easier for the sperm whales to get the big brain than it has been for us to get the big brain because they had this big body and you could, you know, it, it could be in there without all that cost. It doesn't affect them giving birth. It's a much smaller price part of their energy requirements and so on. Okay. So, you know, yeah, there is some cost, but it's nothing like what we pay or maybe a bat pays to have an even smaller brain. So, um, so okay, so what does the, you know, so that suggests that, yes, sperm whales do all kinds of interesting thinking. What do they think about? Well, we have no idea, but, well, we have a little idea, but it's only an idea. And, 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 and one of them is obviously acoustics. They're very acoustic animals. And if you look at highly acoustic animals like the other whales and dolphins, like, um, uh, like us, like, um, uh, some birds like parrots, um, the, like bats, um, you know, the, the, it takes a fair amount of cognition to process sound well. Right. And especially uh, at high speeds, like you need to do for echolocation. So, probably, echo, you know, acoustics is part of it. Um, another thing that's likely to be part of it is sociality. And so, there's been a long standing argument that. One of the drivers of large human brains and large brains in some other primates, and perhaps in other species like some, you know, birds, um, is related to sociality. And if you're living in a social situation, you've got to keep track of your social uh, partners, what they're doing. You know, don't trust this guy; uh, she's lovely. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff which mm -hmm. if you play it right, can that really help you? Um, so um, that's the social brain hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and uh, related to that is the cultural brain hypothesis, which leads back into what we were talking about initially. And the idea that uh, you have the big brain to keep track of all these different things you're learning mm -hmm. uh, and, and to organize them, to use them well. So, um, yeah, so this, the, you know, potentially the sperm or brain is big because of the acoustic brain, the social brain, the cultural brain, and, and maybe some other kinds. Some other hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> some points. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Uh, another area where there's a lot of work to be done as well. There uh, is, yeah. So if, uh, if we can move a little bit towards a more uh, personal questions. Um, so do, do you want to tell us what was the, the most exciting place where you've worked and uh, why? I mean, because you've worked all over, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it is a, you know, there's a, I've worked in some wonderful places and they have different things that 
crabby. Uh, so I first saw sperm whales off Sri Lanka. Well, not saw them, but studied them. And that was pretty wonderful, you know, just to start getting to study them. And that's a pretty wonderful place. Um, I um, staying with sperm whales, then the Galapagos is totally spectacular place to work. Um, you know, the, the seas are calm, so you see more. It's easier to kind of figure out what's going on than other places that I've worked. Um, and then there's all this wonderful life around too. So I love that. And the groups are very large, which is fun. <laughs> yes. Right, in the Galapagos, um, you're saying. Yeah, the Galapagos, yeah. But um, we have also do work off Dominica in the Caribbean. Um, and there, the conditions aren't so good. It's it's rougher. There's mm -hmm. more sh shipping, so on. It's hotter. But my colleague Shane Giro knows those whales. You know, so we go out. He's on the boat, and he knows the whales. You know, no, I mean, they all look like logs to me. But to him, they're all individuals. And he, even without seeing the flukes which have the identification marking he just from the way it's moving at the surface this log he says that's so and so and you know she's the mother of so and so and she tends to do this and and, and uh, babysit this other calf and the, you know so to have that whole um intimate picture of the animals is extraordinary and that's um, due to his work off Dominica, and we only get that there. That's the only place okay. that I've been that we have anything like that. Occasionally elsewhere we'd say, oh, isn't that well, well the same one we saw yesterday and isn't she doing such and such? But to know, have these individuals who have, he's got, lot, you know, he's known them for 15 years. He knows what each of them are, you know, that we know their genealogy, who their mums are, who their calves are, who they babysit, what they sound like. Um, you know right. how they interact with humans um yeah it, okay. I, that is very very cool <laughs> uh and obviously working on the field um there's several um challenge and constraints uh what has been like the a big challenge that you've uh, that you face all over the years or in a particular time you know, well, uh, with acoustics, so acoustics are always uh, getting problems. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of challenges. Well, yeah. one is, yeah, as you mentioned, the technical, you know, things <laughs> breaking <laughs> at sea, you know, seawater and electronics. electronics don't go too well. <laughs> and so things break. I mean, I've got better, you know, now we tend to bring uh, backups of pretty much everything, which is right. a good idea. Um, you know, we go out for, well, it varies, but between, usually between about 10 days and three weeks at a time. And uh, so that's an issue. Um, bad weather's an issue. So particularly our work here uh, on the Northern Bombers Wales, the weather can, weather here off, you know, Nova Scotia can get pretty nasty at times. Yeah. I mean, I have a very seaworthy, solid boat, but it, uh, yeah, it's it, it's not terrible. It's not nice to be out there in a storm, and uh, obviously you don't get any data either. Um, so um, you know, the, those challenges, the the challenges of uh, fitting, you know, long times at sea and with other bits of one's life. You know, especially when I had young kids. So on. Um, there's the challenges of finding a good crew, which um, I've been pretty lucky, we had, especially recently, had a really good crew usually. But uh, sometimes not. Sometimes you have someone on board who hates it, and that can be difficult, obviously, for them, but also for the rest of the right. crew. Um, so, you know, there's those things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's challenging. <laughs> it is very I mean, challenging. If it wasn't challenging, everyone would be out there doing it because it sounds so great, but it is quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people in general have this romantic idea that we just go in a boat and sail around or, you know, and um, yeah, I don't think it, 
it doesn't like 10 percent corresponds to it <laughs> that's right <laughs> great so one final question who inspired you over the years who were your idols or still are uh, over the years well um uh, i was very inspired by roger payne i worked for him for a bit you know the the guy who discovered the humpback song yeah. and started to write well studies in Argentina. Yeah. And he was always thinking about different ideas and things and hypotheses. And a lot of them were way out there and wild, and, but some of them were right and were fascinating and, and guide what we do today. And he was always prepared to go out and try something new and try new technologies, new ways of thinking and so on. So he's always been an inspiration. Another uh, scientist of that era who you may or may not have heard of is a guy called Stephen Katona, who started the humpback whale uh, catalog uh, in the 1970s. And he uh, put here in the Northwest Atlantic. And it was a remarkable thing. And he managed to get a lot of diverse people with diverse, a, lot, a number of diverse scientists with diverse personalities, some with big egos, to all work together and contribute their pictures to the catalog and used it to produce great insights into the uh, lives of the whales. And um, at the same time, you know, people were studying humpbacks in other places, such as in the North Pacific, which is easier in many ways. It's much easier to work in Hawaii than it is in the Caribbean or to work in Alaska than it is off Newfoundland. But the insights were coming from here, from the Northwest Atlantic and, and Steve, because he fostered this collaborative way of working, um, you know, had a huge impact and it persists to this day. So here, uh, I don't work on right whales here, but right whales are a huge issue all along the Eastern coast of the US and up here in Eastern Canada. And um, uh, there's a large collection of right whale scientists, more right whale scientists than right whales by a large margin, um, who all work pretty damn closely together and collaboratively to help the right whales. And it's really impressive. And that's uh, that what happened there was the guy who started that was Steve Katona's student, right? So here's social learning. Steve Katona showed this collaborative way and how, how it works and how it can be so productive. And his student, Scott Krauss, learned from him and infiltrated that into the right whale community, and it's there. And, and um, so, yeah, those would be two major influences. On yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting uh, because uh, during these interviews and all that, uh, Roger Payne, it's a, it's a name that everybody says. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Which is well, which is obviously uh, normal, and um, and of course he deserves all the all those credits that we we gave him for sure. Uh, but uh, you are also an inspiration for younger scientists, such okay. as myself and others. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll thank you so much for the great work you've been uh, doing uh, your entire life and um and it's been amazing um and of course everybody that can get the chance to come across you it's always it's always a pleasure and a learning process that's for sure it's always a very big learning process every time you talk so thank you so much for this thank you very much and uh, now i'm gonna stop recording <laughs> okay where do I stop? Uh, Thank you.